in its simplest definition, war is about killing people and breaking all their stuff. And then, you know, the realization that man, this, was, this was probably not going to be good. I went to Boylan High School and I was in the second class to start at Boylan. So I started high school in 1961, graduated in 1965. I enjoyed Boylan a lot. I um, had good, good uh, teachers. I got in a little bit of trouble my freshman and sophomore year and the dean of students uh, kind of got an interest in me and straightened me out. So that was all good. And then beginning of my senior year, I, I met a, a, a junior young woman that ended up being my wife. Patrick was finishing up high school and looked towards continuing his education through college. But the United States was in need of more men for the Vietnam War. Went the first semester of my freshman year to Northern Illinois University and I didn't like that. And I transferred to St. Norbert's because I had some friends up there and had visited there and, and thought that would be a better environment for me. L, uh, Northern being on the semester program and St. Norbert's was on a trimester program so I was out of school for a short period of time probably from the middle of January to early part of March and my draft board didn't like that and they did draft me but I was able to join the advanced course in ROTC and graduate before I had to go on active duty. At the start of the war when the bombing operation Rolling Thunder began in March of 1965 against North Vietnam as it was one of the first acts to stop the spread of communism, it triggered the first anti-war protest against the Vietnam War due to the bombing of North Vietnam occurring on a daily basis. It ranged from students who were organized by their own professors to middle class families that witnessed their sons being sent to war without seeing them ever again. Most people back home opposed the war as Vietnam started to reach its climax in 1968. I, I felt fortunate that I was born in America. I thought this was probably the best country in the world to be born into, and I felt fortunate because of that. So I felt like there was some dues that needed to be paid by everybody, and, and I was willing to do that, and I, I was kind of surprised that they weren't willing to do it. Although it was news to Patrick that he was being drafted, he made sure to spend time with his loved ones before being shipped off into the Army which was essential to Pat as well as to his wife. But Patrick also saw other reasoning to why he was being sent off into Vietnam. When I went to Vietnam, and uh, I, I remember vividly the night before, uh, my wife and I went to a play up at Bloyd College. And then uh, one of my brothers suggested that he would drive me to O'Hare and I'd just say goodbye my wife here. So that's what I did. Camp Eagle was located southeast of Hue in central Vietnam. This is where Pat was trained from a civilian to a pilot for his main role in the Vietnam War. You'd get up early in the morning, they'd wake you up and you'd, you'd get dressed quickly, stand in formation, and then you'd march to a parade field and do calisthenics. And one day it was, uh, it was cold, it was real cold. And the ground was, had like frost on it. And so we all brought our gloves that we were told to do that. And, and there was probably 200 of us. And, and one, of the, one of the guys forgot his gloves. So we're thinking, wow, his, his hands are going to really get cold. Well, the drill instructor said, all right, everybody else take your gloves off. Because we're, we're in the military and we do this uniformly. So we'll all be the same. So. We all took our gloves off and nobody got to have gloves. So I thought, not sure I quite understand the logic of this, but later it kind of, in a weird sense, it did, it did kind of prove out that, you, you know, you, you, have to, you have to function uniformly and you have to, to, to do what you're told to do. And there's consequences if you don't. So that was probably a good life lesson. 
Pat finished his training and was being prepared for the road ahead of him throughout Vietnam, but Pat kept his head forward and was looking to get through the next few days ahead. Then, on the way towards Vietnam, a question dawned across his entire group. The realization, he said, did you think you could really shoot somebody? Do you, do you really think you could kill somebody? And I, I said, well, I, you know, I don't, never really thought about it, but yeah, I think I could. And then one of the other guys said, oh, you know, the common thing was, you know, kill them all and let God sort it out. And then one of the other guys said, geez, I don't know, never really thought about it. So that was probably kind of a, uh, a realization that, yeah, this, this, this isn't training anymore. This is going to be, this is going to be war. When first arriving to Vietnam at Camp Eagle, southeast of Hue, he was expecting much more to happen. But Pat had a different experience than others as he walked into the camp to receive his first orders in the Vietnam War. This day was pretty boring. I mean, you know, you, 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 you're doing paperwork and you're being processed. You're tired. You're probably intimidated a little bit by that. So I, I just remember the first, the first day just being kind of a waste of time. And then when my orders came down and, and I got my assignment to the 101st, then, you know, that's when it kind of the excitement started. Um, because to go, to go from, from Saigon to Fubai was probably, probably be like going from maybe Rockford to St. Louis. I mean, it was, it's, you know, it's basically from the southern part of Vietnam to the northern part of South Vietnam, so. And then, um, again, there was probably another day of in-processing and they have to find the specific unit that you're going to go to. I mean, the 101st had probably two to 3,000 troops, and you get assigned to a company, and I got assigned to Alpha Company, that's A Company, of the 101st Aviation Battalion. It was an assault helicopter company, and we were called the Comancheros. And that was probably a couple days after I arrived in Fubai. And then it turned out one of the guys that I uh, lived in an apartment complex with, um, who was a couple flight classes ahead of me, was in that unit. So at least right away I knew somebody. And I, that was uh, a benefit, I think. The role of the Bell UH-1 Iron Coist, or nicknamed Huey, played an important role in the Vietnam War. With pilots flying in to do resupplying, transporting soldiers, and transport the wounded. The Huey is the most iconic vehicle used in the Vietnam War due to how much soldiers relied on the air and transportation in Vietnam to survive. There were times where dropping off troops became a dangerous task. In these situations, the mountain machine guns were important to the crew in case of being fired upon and needed to ensure the survival of getting out of hot situations. I had two jobs. I was a, an assault helicopter pilot and we flew the UH-1 Huey. And obviously when you get there, you fly as a co-pilot for a while. But I'd also been trained to do maintenance test flights. And somebody had to test fly them to see if everything had been done correctly. I mean, we weren't, we weren't test pilots like trying to you know, figure out the aerodynamics and if it would fly. We were just doing things to make sure that everything had been put back together right and it was capable of being flown the way we flew them in Vietnam. So, um, some days that's all I did was test fly, some days I'd fly assault missions uh, in the morning, test fly either in the afternoon or at night. Usually at that time when I first got there we flew primarily Americans and then they'd have coordinates that, that you were going to take them to and you'd insert them. Sometimes you'd insert them into uh, fairly large landing zones or LZs we called them. Um, Sometimes there'd be nobody there. I mean, it was pretty boring. It was just like, you know, moving people around. Sometimes you'd get there 
and there were North Vietnamese or Viet Cong there and they'd start shooting at you. And we had a door gunner and a crew chief, each had their own machine gun. And so some of those got pretty exciting. But we were going in to pick up a, 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 a mostly Vietnamese troops and move them into a combat assault. And one of the vehicles that they were in hit a landmine and it, 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 it just kind of slow motion in my mind flipped over and landed on a lot of the, these troops. And so then the, the medical people you know, ran over there and they put them on stretchers or what we call litters and they're running them over to our health. Well, my, my aircraft commander said, hey, we better hover over there and we'll, we can medevac some of these guys. But we weren't, we weren't a medevac helicopter. I mean, all we had was an empty floor and people were sat on it. So as we hovered over there, I'm envisioning these, they're gonna take about three of these stretchers and you know, put them on the floor and off we'll go. Cause we didn't have the racks like the medevac helicopters had. Well, the first guys, the first two guys come up with a stretcher and they just went and dumped this guy in and another one dumped them in and I'm like, what the hell's going on? And well, they, they needed the stretchers to bring more of them. So they, they must have, they had a, a stack of them practically in there. And then we took them, we, we flew them to a medevac, or I mean, to an evacuation hospital. Again, probably a realization that we're not training anymore. This is, this is, you know, this is the real deal. Well, with my wife, we almost exclusively sent cassette tapes back and forth. Um, at least after I'd been there a while and, and you know, got to the PX and bought a, a cassette recorder. Um, she did some of that when, when she'd get a tape from me, she'd uh, maybe record over it and send it back. But she sent me a, a lot of letters. She's, a, she's an excellent writer and she probably wrote letters six out of seven days a week. These are the memories that stuck with Patrick during this time as Vietnam was a big part of his life for the months he was there. Um, I, I never, you know, I, I never got close to a Viet Cong like I even am to you. I, I would see him and the crew chiefs and the door gunners would be shooting at him. I only once saw one close enough for me to shoot at. He was shooting at me, um, so I shot at him with my revolver. Again, I was, I was a co-pilot, I wasn't flying, so I, my, my, my hands were free to do that. Um, so I never had communication contact with them, with 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 the Viet Cong or the or the what we call the NVA, the North Vietnamese. Um, we did have opportunity to talk to the South Vietnamese troops at times, but um, I never had any real interaction with the NVA. I mean, what I would consider personal interaction. And we started doing combat assaults almost exclusively with South Vietnamese troops, and that my feeling changed. I mean, we would, we would go into hot LZs where we'd want to come in as fast as we could, uh, land a, or hover about three or four feet off the ground. We'd expect them to jump out like the Americans did. We'd count to five and we'd leave because, I mean, there was a lot of stuff going on in there and you didn't want to stay. And sometimes you'd go in and they wouldn't get out. You know, they're, they're like, what the hell? I, I don't want to get out and get shot. So they'd stay in the helicopter. Well, that wasn't working for us. And then the worst situation is if, if you were going in to pick them up because they were in a bad firefight, and typically in a Huey, depending a little bit on the weather, but fairly typically, we could carry about eight to 10 Americans because they were bigger, and we would carry maybe 12 to 13 South Vietnamese. But you come in to pick them up, and instead of 12 of them getting on, 14, 15 would get on and five, four or five more would hang on each skid and, and the helicopters just, we couldn't take off with that much weight. And, and so, you know, the bad things had to have happen to get them out of there because, you know, we weren't going to, we, we couldn't stay there. So, yeah, my, uh, my, my attitude towards the South Vietnamese started to change when, when that was going on. We were there for a year and we got to go home. They were there for the whole war. I mean, it was their war and they were there for the duration. So I sort of get it, but you know, a big part of, I think most veterans would tell you, a, a big part of our motivation day to day was to make sure we got home. I mean, that, that, was, that was our primary motivation was to stay alive. 
I, I remember being in Da Nang, which was just south of, of Fubai, and there was an out-processing center. I uh, don't remember any of the guys that I was with. I, I remember just, just the excitement that, hey, this, is, this was over. Um, um, I, was, I was leaving Vietnam a couple months early, um, so I only served about 10 months in Vietnam. I, I don't see how you could say it any other way. I mean, we certainly didn't win it. Um, I, you know, I kid with a lot of the guys that I'm friends with now that are veterans because I went there late. I was there in 71. They were there 67, 68. And I said, well, you know, if you guys would have done your job well, I wouldn't have had to go. And they always say, well, we were winning when I left. So <laughs> whether we were not, I don't know. But I think the way we had to leave and the fact that it's now controlled by the North Vietnamese makes it pretty obvious we didn't win. Call it second place if you want, but we didn't win. But there's not anything about my service where I thought I deserved any form of recognition. I was involved in a, um, that, the thing that Dave Rydell did a year ago on Veterans Day down at the Metro Center in, in, the, in the planning of that. And when we were first uh, talking about it, he said he wanted to honor veterans. And, and my reaction to that was, uh, especially Vietnam veterans, I, I don't think we're looking for people to honor us. It'd just be nice if somebody thanked us. So I, I don't feel like, like my service, um, somebody should honor me before, because of it. It's nice when somebody thanks you for it, though. With Patrick being home, his mother and father were thrilled for his return. But one person wasn't aware of his homecoming, and that was Patrick's wife. This was Patrick's chance to make a heartwarming return. My mom called my wife, and, and they did this occasionally a couple times a month. She said, well, why don't you come over for dinner? So she did, and, uh, and uh, I think the way it worked is they had you know, a phone upstairs and a phone downstairs, and when my wife pulled in the driveway, my mom was yelled out the door, said, Pat's on the phone, come on in. He wants to talk to you. So I was upstairs, and you know, she came in, and she said, hey, and I said, hey, I got some really good news. And uh, she said, what? I said, I'm gonna get out early. You know, I'm coming home. And she said, she said well, well, when? And I said, well, hang on, I'll ask. And then I walked downstairs. So that was kinda, that was kinda exciting. We, we laugh about that. So uh, yeah, that, that was a very memorable way of coming home. At the start of the year, I was told by many to join the Harlem Veteran Project. At first, we came in, they told us what to expect, and I was thrilled. But there was also another side that it takes a lot of time, it, talks, it takes a lot of effort, and lots of responsibility. And at first, I didn't think I could do it. My veteran might not even like what I give them. And then I just decided to give it a shot, to give myself a challenge. This challenge was very big as throughout the year in his documentary, I wanted to capture his emotions through the footage and on what he experienced in Vietnam. When I first actually picked Patrick, I saw Vietnam and I thought, and his job, his job title was incredible during Vietnam as I knew as a Huey pilot was extraordinary. To actually choose the parts of his interview to match my documentary, I wanted to tell his story. I wanted to make sure his story is told. And that was one of the most vital components of my project. I actually met Patrick a few weeks ago, and he was thrilled that he came in, was, be able, to, was able to share photos with me and actually give a story behind each one of them. And I thought that was amazing of my veteran to do. And I'm, I'm just very thankful of what he's gone through, what he's done for us, what he's done for our country, that he was willing to serve. And I just want to thank him for it. <laughs>